Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, everybody certainly in the audience. Uh, everybody who is in attendance are uh, town officials who represent us. Um, the HBIA, who helped sponsor this through Chris Brown. The South Mountain Rock Civic Association, specifically Terry, with whom I spoke to arrange this, as well as Bob, who's kind enough to set everything up. Um, I want everybody to look to the left and look to the right. Look behind you and look in front of you. Do you know everybody? Shake hands and introduce each other. You got 20 seconds. Go. Ahead. Here's the agenda. The agenda's been put on everybody's seat. 
and at the same time, the topics that we're going to cover. Dave Conti, who's over here, gentleman in the blue shirt, the Patriot shirt, go past, uh, is going to check off once we have something accomplished. At the same time, if questions come up that haven't been answered, that need still some follow-up, open action items, Dave is going to write it on that flip chart right there. So there's a sense of accountability, uh, frankly, for all of us. So, a couple more thoughts. I hear all the time, the town. The town did this, or when is the town going to fill in the blank? We are the town. The definition of the town is an area comprised of people that has a name, defined boundaries, and local government. A village is a subset of the former. That's right off the internet. Thanks. Thank you, Google. So we are the town. Yes, we have our elected and appointed officials here with us who can help make decisions. And frankly, they recognize that there is a problem, not only in Hong Kong, but all is situated. That's why the Postal Advisory Commission three and a half years ago was started. Recognizing the valuable resource that situation has, and oh, by the way, something has to be done. So if we can all look at this from the standpoint of we are the town, and hopefully move something forward. And I'm very, very impressed with everybody who is here because I've recognized that it's a big commitment. Let's address the elephant, elephants in the room. We are going to discuss the beach, beach dune project, and the um, uh, road elevation project. We are not going to discuss the dredging of the North slash South River. We're not going to discuss storm cleanup as it relates to March or any other year or anything else. And one thing that we don't want to discuss is what occurred in Hong Rock in 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, da, 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 da. I love Hong Rock. I love the people of Hong Rock. We have an incredible group of historians, so we want to stick to the facts and to the project at the end. Any comments or questions on that so far? All right, so ground rules. Questions and answers have been provided to you, if not electronically, we have paper copy up here. We're going to read the questions. I'm going to read the questions. Brad's going to read the answer. We're going to go section by section by section. A, B, and C. Uh, the purpose of the, step of, the um, uh, of the project, the engineering design and the easements, in that order. Once we get through the official question of that section, we're going to ask people if, in the audience, do you have a question? If it was misunderstood, I apologize. I, I purposely said you can ask one question at a time. We've all been to meetings where somebody says, I have a question, and 17 and a half questions later, that same person's up there. Okay. I get it. Every question is important. You'll be able to ask the questions one at a time. And if, in fact, it's off topic, I will interrupt and say, if we recovered that, it's not part of this section, or whatever the situation is. Okay? And if you have additional questions, we're going to go to the next person who hasn't asked a question, get to the end of that line to come back to you with the United second, third, fourth, whatever the question number is. Just so we're fair uh, uh, to everyone. Does that make sense? Because I've been asked several times, how come I can only ask one question? Ask what you want. Just have to do one at a time. As I said before, Dave's going to keep the flip chart, and uh, we are uh, going to uh, move forward. So, that said, we've done the welcome and the introduction. We've done the ground rules. We're uh, about four minutes behind. I apologize, but we had some audiovisual uh, challenges. So why don't we get started with the uh, uh, questions. The first section is background and purpose. If you don't have these questions physically on your person, they are up there on that table. Thank you, mind uh, walking around and handling them? Thank you. Also, they've been emailed out. Once again, we're going to do one section at a time, background and purpose first. I'm going to go through the questions, and Brad's going to answer them as written, and then open up to the floor for questions. First question, what is the purpose of the project? Thank you, Keith. Uh, the town received uh, over $100,000 of grant funding from the State Office of Coastal Zone Management 
to evaluate dew nourishment alternatives and roadway elevation improvements along a low-lying section of Central Avenue on North Home Rock Beach uh, to provide storm damage protection for repetitively damaged areas. For over a year, the town has been working with a consulting engineer, uh, John Ramsey here from Applied Coastal, to prepare environmental permit filings and engineering plans to elevate a portion of Central Avenue along Northern Home Rock Beach and to construct a mixed sediment berm. Question two, what are the study limits? In other words, where does it begin and where does it end geographically? The limits of this full study are from approximately 10 Cliff Road South to 130 Central Avenue. Phase one, a 1,800-foot northern section of the project area, goes from 10 Cliff Road South to 244 Central Avenue. What is being proposed? The proposal is to elevate Cliff Road South in Central Avenue and to construct a mixed, mixed sediment which consists of cobble, gravel, and sand burn along the study limits. Can the road be elevated without constructing the burn or vice versa? It is recommended that the burn and elevated road be constructed together to provide effective storm damage protection and maintain emergency egress. How much will a, pro uh, a project cost? The full project will cost approximately $9.6 million to construct, plus additional allowances to relocate utilities, repave driveways, and add risers to septic systems. Phase one of the project will cost approximately $3.6 million. The cost of the allowances that we just mentioned will be determined in the final design of the project. From a historical perspective, how and when have the progress of this project been communicated in the past? Um, so I'm not going to read this for me, but I will go over the meetings with the ad. So the following is, is a list of public meetings that we held. Um, the first was in March 28, 2017, held at the library. Um, that was the initial project meeting to, to go over the scope of the study. Uh, we held another meeting on June 6th, 2017 at the Public Safety Complex where we discussed conceptual designs for the project. August 30th, 2017, uh, there was a meeting here uh, to talk about easements. And lastly, we just held a meeting on June 25th of this year uh, at the high school. And that was an informational meeting and presentation um, to provide an update and to discuss next steps. Um, further down in this document, so if you're reading the document on page two, halfway down, there's also a series of, of links. So if you go to um, these websites, you'll actually see uh, videos of each one of those meetings and a copy of the presentation that was made that night. All right, so that's uh, the first section. Um, the background and the purpose. Now we're going to turn it to you guys. If someone has a question, please raise your hand. I will come to you. Or if you want to set up a line here, that's fine too. But I, I have no problem. I can walk around. Um, when you ask a question, please state your name and where you live, and then ask one question. If the question is off topic or going to be covered in a sec, a sec subsequent section, I will let you know that. So, uh, Stacy, I think I saw you raise your hand first. Thank you. I'm Stacy Clark, and I live at 10 Marshfield Ave. And my question has to do with the road elevation, and specifically whether or not there will be trenches or drains built alongside the road elevation to allow the water to pass to a desired location and not into the river. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. That's probably going to come up more on the design itself and the engineering. Great question. Let's hold it for that. Any other specifics on the background and the purpose of the project? Again, let's start big picture. Hello, Robert. 
big picture uh, and go from there. So my name is Brenda Roach and I live at 232 Central Ave. Um, I'm just curious about, they were talking about sand, um, rocks, cobble, um, the firm. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, where, where is that coming from? I'll turn it over to either Brad or John, um, who uh, would be able to answer that better. Um, so the material we would get would be from an open source, and so a lot of this material would need to be, well, called manufactured, but it is natural material. If you see people coming in with angular rock or something like that, that's not what we would be using. We'd be using natural material that matches what's in the firm now. So we would actually get some from, you know, like the Carver or Florence, Massachusetts have two sources that are both fairly far away, but, and then uh, some other material might come as close to Plymouth. But there's, there are sources that we would kind of engineer to make what we want as far as the <laughs> great side. Thank you. Also, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Frank Schneider came in, he's chair of the Conservation Commission. Uh, he wasn't here when I said hello, that's all right. See me after class. John, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, John Stanton, 130 Central Lab. Uh, I live at 130 Central Lab, and uh, I routinely, by storms, I watched the flooding at 1, 124 Central, south of the uh, of the ocean, of road the driveway, and fill the street with sand and cobble and so on and so forth. And further down in Newell, that routinely, the ocean runs right down Newell Street, across into the lower section of Newell on the, on the west side, Riverside. <coughs> My question to the engineer is, who set the limits on the study? And why wasn't it the study brought all the way down to where the seawall begins south of at, at, at Newell Street? Make that determination the limit of the study. John, the secondary question was the same one was who made the determination on the limits of the study? John, is that this? Answer by you? Yes. Um, so uh, when we did the study for the whole town, we had limits uh, where we, we came up with limits of all the areas. What we were focused on here was the most critical area of where the road was lowest. And so it ended up in was uh, I mean, the main street we ended up limiting it to, but that was the most critical area, and the way a lot of that was decided had to do with repetitive loss damage to homes. So one of the things that we took the data that was available, which was the theme of flooding, so we not necessarily be, you know, we know there's other areas that are, they get eroded, even down here, we know there's, there's overwash. But the primary area when we focused things was on the most critically areas that were damaged, the most as far as FEMA repetitive loss. Thanks, John. Another question on scope? Lock for Freddy, too many plus. For our, there's going to be uh, four feet, four feet above the deck I'm standing. Uh, my house gets pounded with rocks without the Firm just seems like it's putting bullets as a machine gun. That the way it's going to come up, feed the wave rocks. And the elevation of the homes, how do you determine? Is some house going to have four feet? Because it's places down the road that are in pylons that are about 10 feet higher. So is, is the firm going to be uniform down the beach? Or in? How long do you expect that firm to last? And will it be upgraded and repaired every couple of years? So like forever, I will have a firm that's four feet above my deck. Great, great questions. Um, really belongs under the engineering design. So hold on to that for that section, thank you. Uh, and at the same time, that will be discussed in terms of further repair under these things. So, so great question, let's hold it to that section, it's okay. Sir, I want to be the noise 35 the road south. My question is more on this the fourth item. The recommendation that the firm the elevated road 
have a separate project. Can you expand on that answer that it's recommended and whether or not the projects could be separated? Back to John. Um, so the, the purpose of the berm, and so we have, we have the berm and we have the runway elevations. The purpose of the berm is to protect us from the ocean, protect you from the ocean. So that is really there for wave protection going over, over the, uh, the road from the ocean side. Elevating the road, right now the road has a, several locations that are actually well below what we call the still water flooding elevations, just where the ocean comes up and you, and you experience that a lot in the January storm. We had a very, very high tide, even though it wasn't a, a severe wave storm as the, the March storm. So with that, the purpose of the roadway elevation is to pre prevent you, you from getting flooded from the river side. So, you really need to do both to make sure we maintain the, that emergency egress. You raise the road so that we can keep the uh, emergency egress going, and then the berm's there to prevent the waves from over top. So you really need to do both at the same time. That make sense? Speaking to uh, uh, background and purpose, uh, we're obviously going to get into a lot of the detail that's under the engineering design. Are there any other questions, big board questions, specific to the background and the purpose? Okay. Um, Frederick Rhodes, 232 Central Lab. I'm just curious if you raise the road, um, right now my house goes right like flat to the road. Would I have to go on stilts if, I, if I'm not already on stilts? Because we're going to go to the engineering design next, we'll still answer the question, then we're just going to move the question about engineering design. So the way we have this is right now we, we've actually categorized all the homes in the project area. So whether they, they need to have a, a, a ramp, you know, sloping which way. Right now the, the first phase um, I believe all of those homes, there's actually no home that's actually lower than what the roadway were elevated to. So basically in that first phase, at least everything's going to be flat or down slope to the road. So you will be fine. But if, if you're in the phase two, we still have to work out some of those engineering details, especially as you get to the areas where the homes are very close to the road. Um, so that is something that still needs to be worked out. Um, it really is, uh, a lot of those issues have to do with the houses that are on solid foundations right now that have the garages that are facing right up with the road, if that's, if that's you. Um, so there, there are some issues that need to be worked out with that, but th that would be the next phase. If there aren't any more questions on the background of the purpose, we're going to switch over to engineering design. Oh, one more question over here. I'll be right back to you, so I'm sorry. I don't saw this woman's hand first. The barracks of 296 Central Ave. Has anyone taken into consideration that flooding from the roadway would not be an issue if the town contractors were continually filling in the marsh with cobble after every storm? So that's again an engineering design question. We'll hang on to that until we get into it. All good questions. Sir, did you have a question up front? Did you have a question, sir? Me and Mars, 253 Central Ave, I'm on. Road elevation. And pertaining to the road elevation. Unfortunately, I have a row of wind blocks across my own property. Now, I was, I was not going to take it into the box. Is it going to go to the height of the box? Will I have to lift the box? Or is the town going to do that? That probably falls directly in line with what John just said uh, to print a few seconds ago uh, in terms of the next phase, but I'll let you answer the question. So, so you're one of the homes on the, the west side of the road? Yeah, okay. So um, with those, those homes, I do not believe there's, there's, any, um, there's any issues with you needing to raise the blocks or anything. I think that the, the way your projects are set up, that can work right with that. I would have to look at the details, but I'm pretty sure that there's no, none of your walls have any issues whatsoever. You're, you're a little quickly kind of wall around your property. Okay. I'm sorry, sir, go ahead. Excuse me. You're raising the road 20 inches, and it doesn't seem, you know, you raise the road to the height of, so you say, my blocks, and then when the ocean is coming over, the water just coming over. 
maybe, maybe let me take a shot at, at understanding during the next phase, <clears throat> will individual homeowners have the opportunity to have engineering specific type discussions about their property in the process? So, so we're in the initial phases of, of the engineering. So this is, you know, we have prepared some of the permitting, permitting documents, but we are going to be going through a very long permitting process and engineering process. There's going to be a lot of communication on very specific homes and what needs to be done at which home. We have elevations along the whole portion of Central Avenue that, that's going to be raised, but I will, will point out that there's not a consistent elevation, areas of consistent elevation everywhere. We looked at what we can do within the context of making sure we're not doing exactly what you're concerned about at various properties. And so it's not being raised to a you know a very high elevation. We're working with the contours that we have. And I believe in your area it's not going up by 20 inches, it's going up by less. And I think well certainly in the uh, the documents that Brad had referenced, <clears throat> it's uh, almost like a distribution chart, if you will, that shows, you know, okay, what's the elevation by street number or, or within every five or ten or something like that, if I recall correctly. So why don't we go on to engineering design? Oh, keep the lead. So this is specific to the benefit and the purpose of uh, the study. closer to the water 
will be seen here with the transition at the toe of the burn. Have other technologies or techniques been considered for this project and why has the proposed techniques been suggested? So John just went to uh, detail about one alternative that was looked at. Uh, but yes, a number of alternatives were considered to provide storm damage protection for an overcome rock. Those included seawalls and revetments, managed retreat, and other innovative alternatives such as uh, artificial reefs and breakwaters. Uh, the alternatives analysis can be found in the 2016 report titled Coastal Erosion, Sediment Transport, and Prioritization Management Strategy Assessment for Shoreline Protection. It's a mouthful, but the, the terminology is here, the title of the report's here. It's available on our website. If you have problems finding it, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and we'll get you a copy. Based on the results of the alternative analysis, the recommended shore protection approaches were to elevate Central Avenue and construct a mixed sediment dunes along North Hum Rock. It goes, again, because the, the report broke up into sections of town, there was a recommendation to address uh, the rest of Hum Rock, but just focusing on North Hum Rock, it was elevating the road and doing the mixed sediment dune. Last question for this section, then we're going to open it up to uh, everyone here in attendance. Are there any real-world examples where similar technologies have been constructed and been successful? Yes. In 2012, the mixed sediment nourish pro nourishment project was done in the town of Winthrop. Uh, the nourishment project included approximately 450,000 cubic yards of sand, cobble, and gravel material to provide protection to neighboring homes and businesses from flooding and storm damage. And this, this size project is equivalent to what is being proposed here in North Hong Kong. All right, so now we're going to uh, open up to uh, the floor. The subject is engineering design. Stacy, I promise you that you'll be able to ask the question first. So I'm gonna pass it back to Stacy. Uh, Thank you, Stacy Clark, 10 Marshfield Ave. My question has to do with the road elevation and whether or not channels, drains, or some form of engineering trenches would be constructed to allow the stormwater, rainwater to flow efficiently in a direction away from the homes along the river, which have been impacted in the past by um, the water. Great question, Sean. Just as a reminder, if you feel the need to draw something, this is actually Stacy's idea. And they lent us the uh, marker pens and the eraser uh, from Hong Rock Open House, so thank you very much. Uh, so if you need to draw something, uh, go for it. I'm confused. Uh, <laughs> I'll now kind of answer the question the best way I can. Um, the way that, the, and again, what I've talked about is, is the roadway elevation is really intended to keep the river from flooding over. The, the gravel of, of the beach itself, you have a <laughs> um, The gravel of the beach itself is, will drain rainwater quite effectively. So we really don't have to worry about channelizing, at least channelizing the water for rainwater. The only issue that comes in is if, if water gets over the road, but does not, uh, and it has no room to escape. So there are areas, uh, and again, these are not areas in this phase one, there are areas where we have to work out some of the issues with those driveways, and there likely will be one-way um, drainage from some areas that they would have, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's pipes that have duct filled valves that may be needed in a couple places, but it's going to be very few places. But again, if we raise the roadway up to the elevation we're talking about, the river should almost never, and I would say almost never, uh, flood across the street. So it would be only happened during storms that I have to say the January storm was a very unique high tide. It was only one high tide, but boy was it a doozy. Um, and that that is you know kind of right at the design limits where we were looking. Um, so there may be some issues on those events, but it, no matter what it is, it's going to be a lot better than what we're experiencing now. 
Um, and so we would provide some drainage, but it's not going to be, we're not going to be able to, you know, if we have the, uh, a sandy like hit New York, nobody's going to be able to design something that's going to withstand all of that. But I guess that I won't draw it out, but I'm sure I will in a few minutes. But the purpose of this really is to get that roadway up to an elevation so the river's not flooding across, and then the burn will prevent the water from coming over from the ocean side. So that's that's the idea. So your, your homes, as long as you're on that side of the road, on the side of the road, your homes should not be getting flooded from either direction during anything except being catastrophic on a race. Thanks, Sean. And when, and when you uh, do uh, draw it, I will hold the microphone so you can talk and draw at the same time. Technology. Uh, Mr. Freddie, I know you had a question uh, that I kind of stiff armed you. Uh, that's all right. Uh, let me uh, come back with you once again your name, address, and your question. We're Freddie, 294 Central Island. I'd just like to back up a little to the real world examples. To the in 2012, did this in winter. It was 2018. This, and the answer to the question is no really update of how it worked, how often you had to maintain the work, and was it a success? I mean, it just says yes, we did, but it, but it doesn't explain positively well, we'll that first, or so negative. Before you ask me all the questions. <laughs> so, so that falls under the category of I'm from Missouri, show me. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so I actually was the designer of that project. Um, if you actually search on the globe, there was some frustration about the project because people didn't like the way it looked. It was too coarse because people wanted Revere Beach. Um, but that was very similar to this beach. It was a coarser beach, and we merged it with coarser material uh, to, make, to match the beach. And what ended up happening was when we had that January storm, the one thing was very interesting is when we flooded from the back side. And it was the first time it didn't flood from the front side. So that has performed extremely well. Um, it has it uh, not been maintained to this point. Um, so it did survive all those Northeasters last year. We did not have any flooding. Um, but at the same time, it is, because of those storms, especially the March storm, there was some adjustment of the work. And I know that it, it's a state project. DCR is planning right now on, on looking at what they're going to need to do to re-rate it and maintain it. Um, it's a little bit of a different project where the sediment does actually migrate away uh, because it does have, have a, a sandier fraction than this does. But uh, it, is, it is something that they are looking at maintaining it. But it has not been made to make up to this point. It worked. It worked. I'm going to uh, actually read a question and I'll get right to you, man. I think I may have stiff armed another person, so uh, make sure we get that. Uh, with the, the, the one from the electronic age, uh, this was sent in by Stan Nash, uh, 272 uh, Central Avenue. Uh, he lives in Montreal and he couldn't attend, so he asked me to read the following. Can we assume that beachfront owners will have access to the water by simply walking up and over the dune in front of their house? And if so, will this not erode and decrease the height of the dune by the constant traffic up and over it? And if so, the prescribed height would possibly have to uh, have an effective barrier that will be compromised even before the first storm. So foot traffic up and over, is that going to compromise it? That's the answer. Okay, so foot traffic should not compromise it if, if it was concentrated where you only have one access to the beach and thousands of people walk down that access, yes, it would start compromising it before the winter. One thing I would point out about this project, the way it's designed, the way it's intended, is that the town is allowed to regrade it. This is not a sand dune where we have you know a protected beach plant type thing this is a design engineered burner so that the town is allowed to maintain it and maintain it at that elevation so if there are areas that dip down they are allowed to come back and put it back to the elevation it needs to be at um, so i don't anticipate that being a problem because basically i've seen you know that, you know besides winter you guys actually have another engineer burn in town at the end of Beach. Uh, so that's a bit different, that's almost completely cobble, but that maintains an elevation pretty well without uh, any maintenance, except when you have a major storm and then the town goes out and pushes it back up to the, the prescribed elevation and that seems to uh, do a good job. So that's, that's more the intent of this type of project. It's not to make this natural dune system that uh, 
uh, some people might complain leaves and birds, but you know, this is something as an engineer or All right, ma'am, you had your hand up. Uh, your name, your address, and your question. Gina, Herbal 228 Central Avenue. I'm not in the first phase. I'm close to it. But right now, when the cobble goes across, it's like sacred ground. No one can touch it. The city plows it, it gets higher and higher. So you're talking about fixing one side, but never addressing the other side. And with this firm being in place, it's going to go across eventually. And it's going to add to that pile higher and higher. And then the water just runs down the road. And it has no way of draining. Sounds like there is an engineering question, perhaps a conservation commission question uh, in there as well. So uh, John, I'll, I'll pick on you first. And then if Frank or somebody wants to answer, go for it. I, I'd actually try the conservation side of it, if you want to be safe, but um, I guess that, you know, the first uh, aspect of that is, you know, again, this, this berm is intended to be maintained. So if we let it go away, we let it get to a little elevation like it has gotten now, yes, it washes across the road, yes, you have your problem. The idea here is the, the volume that we're making this and the purpose of this is trying to maintain that volume and that height prevents the waste from getting over so it doesn't overwash the road. Uh, this is a, a very significant volume of material, hence why people are concerned about the views, etc. This is a large work, um, and this is something that, that will be, you know, if, if it's maintained, it's not going to go over top, it's not going to get the center on the other side of the road. Uh, the one thing I will say, and, and I'm sure Frank can, can probably back me up on this, is that yes, once things go over, the, the, the Wellness Protection Act laws or rules require that if something, you know, if you a barrier beach naturally migrates, you have to let it naturally migrate. And that's, and I completely understand, but that is the way the rules are written, um, and that's the way that the, you know, the state laws are written. Um, but if you want to go for it. <laughs> so, so we, after Riley, the commission, DPW, had several meetings with DEP, CCM, discussing that. I mean, it, it looks like a no-brainer. You see all the material on the other side is smothering the marsh. Um, this technology today can recover that material. And, and that was our question multiple times, not just in Hummerock, but back at Bainty Beach and in other locations. And it seemed like the cheapest way to get material back was just recover it from the other side and, and bring it back. And the only, the answer that we got repeatedly was if that material was moved to clear the road, then that material could be transported back to the beach. But any material that naturally occurred on the marsh had to remain. And, well, some of it was plowed and we saw that. And we, we in the places where there were tracks and whatnot, we were, see that and some of that could be relocated. But there's an awful lot of it that's placed naturally. I mean, you know, after how much material gets moved by Mother Nature in a storm, you can move all that material with a phenomenal amount of equipment. It just gets placed there. So we, we know pretty much what gets placed there with the BPW, those kind of things. And they're critical when we cut trenches into that material. So it's not an easy process to, to work through. Question specific to design. This gentleman and ma'am, I'll be right back to you. Your name and your address. Ken Barrett, 294, 296 Central. Um, I, my biggest concern is this is past storm we had in March that lasted four or five cycles. Uh, would that burn have stood much of that? Would that have been in our house, torn down, or whatever, because of the body of cobble that's on the end, which would be on our side, in front of our house? And with the highway, pardon me? Can you repeat that last part? Yeah, with all the cobble that's, you know, back loaded towards the, the decks and the houses, where the stands in the front head, front portion, would that been just chewed away, gone. Cause they, I, I wasn't here, but I heard it was five days of non-stop 20-foot waves. So, I mean, realistically, how much do you think of that would have left? Coming back to John. 
Um, so it is designed to withstand those level of events. The one thing I will point out, I, I was here uh, during the Northeast Action came out. We had an action site visit uh, right at the end of that storm. Um, so all the agencies got to see that too and how bad it is here. Um, I think the one thing that um, I, I guess I'd point out about that is it is designed for that, but you have an advantage here that a lot of uh, people don't in other places. The, the nice thing about this is that we do have a, a high high range here. So while you have a number of tide cycles where it's getting hit, it's only the upper portion, you know, the upper half of your tide cycle where the, the cobble worm is really, the way you really want to overtop it. Um, so, you know, even though it was five days, it's really the, the higher half of that cycle that, that it needs to withstand. And it, it actually is designed to do that. Um, you know, these are, this is over designed for that type of storm. It's meant for not just one event, but it's meant for numerous, you know, any time we have a, a 100 or 50 year storm, we're looking at something that lasts at least three or three, five days. So that is what it's designed to do. Uh, I promise this uh, woman in the back, sir, I'll be right back. Your name, your address, and your question, ma'am? Uh, I'm Denise Wild, I'm from the I'm a 10-foot road south in New York. And uh, we are a 10-foot road with a very beginning of the area. So we have a right way next to our house where everyone goes to the beach. Public walks down here this year. There were many people just kept walking. They brought people off, and I think it's just a public beach anyway. It doesn't matter if it's parking. But how's it going to end? Is it going to go into the brick wrap, which is next to us? It's all falling apart. It hasn't been maintained at all. Or what's going to happen? Is it just going to end in our house? I'm, no one's, I've asked this question a few times, and no one's been able to answer. Okay, <laughs> Uh, so, so it is going to taper at that end. It will taper into the roof at the end of the project, at the north end. Um, and and I, I'm aware that the, that is probably the biggest public access area, and that would be the biggest area of concern where uh, somebody had mentioned about whether the dune gets knocked down. That would be an area that probably in the fall of town would have to come in and make sure it's built back up in the elevation so before northeastern season that we're not creating a, a window for or ways to get through there. I mean, you certainly are well aware of where you are. And it's a tough spot. I mean, you're kind of right at, that, right at the end of a, a bad event. And I saw you guys fix your house this spring. <laughs> I was walking by. <laughs> oh, and, yep. And, 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 I, and I, I'm aware. But it certainly it would be a safer in and, and actually maybe to uh, reiterate on the, the questions asked last, whether this would uh, could survive the five days. I, I should give the example that Winthrop did fine uh, with the five days. Uh, it, it experienced the same storm. It was a it was a bad storm up there as well. So yeah. it's, it's actually a little bit it's it's wider but a little bit lower. But it, it, it did uh, it did perform very well. Hold on, Rich. Uh, I think uh, this gentleman had a question. Now, I'm going to go on to 28 Central. Um, you know, I think that that same doom here and that storm, you probably would have lost close to a third of the, the depth of it on the ocean side coming back towards the houses. Because I put out over a thousand yards in front of my house, you know, two years after each other, and a big storm is gone. And that's 50, let's say 50 feet out from my house. Um, so I, I talked a little bit a while back about beach nourishment, and one of the reasons why we didn't select it as an option, because for beach nourishment, you have to, the longer your nourishment, the better it lasts. Well, this is kind of similar. I, I mean, I, I completely, uh, as a postal engineer, I see a lot of, you know, what I would call piecemeal things, where you're doing some very well-intentioned things in very short stretches of the beach, but they do get washed out very easily, because basically the waves are allowed to focus on those ants very much and wash them right out. So the purpose of this is we're doing a long enough stretch of shoreline, 1,800 feet, and I would agree that there's going to be some volume lost after a storm, but the whole purpose of this is, you know, I know everybody said we're getting a 50-year storm every year, but you know, somebody who does this and actually looks at the statistics 
We did have a bad winter this winter, but in general, I mean, the storms are not getting any more frequent or any more severe. This is, you know, the northeasters, the difference between you know, a one-year storm and a hundred-year storm just isn't that much. But, you know, the, the idea is, is that if we can get this, get this uh, through a winter um, and not have damage, that the, that the, 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 the burn can be recreated in the spring, and then you have protection going into the following year. So the idea is this material is coarse enough that you're not losing it at a very rapid rate. It is going to distribute itself across the beach, but you can regrade it, and uh, it's designed to last uh, quite a long time. You're around to Blue Beach Thanks, Sean. Richard? Richard Bailey, 286 Central. My question is sort of too hard, I'm going to sneak that in. It doesn't fall into either category. I'm curious how Winthrop has made out getting funding to fix theirs, what their status is, and what's the prognosis of getting funding. My concern from the beginning is they do the burn, they put in the easement that there's no money to fix it, and then what? So we have nothing, yeah, what, 15, 10 years, 5 years, whatever it is, we end up with nothing. So I'm curious, two parts, are, are they going for funding? And how is that going? And then the second part is, if it's a small wash away, will the town come in with their own posters or their own private contractors under the town budget and handle to put back, like that boy who said at 10 foot row, a person sounds like it's going to be a neighbor going to come in for us. Okay, will they just come out there and handle it and we don't have to go through the, the, the dilemma of getting funding from a federal agency? Part of that uh, second question may be answered uh, during the easement discussion, but uh, John, you know, I want to remind you if you want a cookie or a bottle of water, they're right over there. No sugar for you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I guess uh, kind, of, kind of remember the way you asked your question. Uh, so how is winter performing in terms of funding? So the winter, I won't say it's a state project, it's a state beach. So the, the funding is a little bit different. I will say, um, that for engineer projects that I've worked on, if you're engineering a beach nourishment project or a new project like this, there is the availability if it's damaged for the town to apply for FEMA funds. I know it's a federal agency, but this is an engineer project, it's an engineer project that's designed to be maintained. If the town is making those efforts to monitor and maintain it just in general, um, like they do up at Man Hill, there is FEMA funding. I'm working with the town right now to actually get, uh, to actually implement some fixes to the manhole burn, basically FEMA funding. So that's that's something that is available, and you know, people don't talk about the thing, people don't want to talk about it, but they are a source. If you're doing a real shoal protection project, this is something they encourage, is to, that those, those sources are available for the town to utilize that as a resource to uh, get funding to maintain this. So it just won't be, oh, it's left to the town and, and uh, all of you guys as taxpayers to, to put the bill. It's, at least that's the purpose. If we're trying to reduce flood damage. You guys are a huge repetitive loss issue for FEMA. They're paying a lot out in claims every time there's a storm. If that gets reduced, they're happy. They look good. So keep that in mind. Did, did that answer both well half the questions? It answered about half of it. The other half is, is the town willing? Hold on, hold on. Is the town willing, planning director and town administrator, are they willing to put their own equipment in there on their own time if we have a breakthrough and not have to wait six months, a year, two years for any team of funding? Jim? When we have storms, we have emergencies like that, we put our equipment out there. The example is my squad pond burn uh, in the March storm. That was a real tough shape during that storm. Within a couple of hours, we had an excavator and a dozer on it put it back in shape. So we'll get out there and do it. The small stuff, as we talked about, we're going to get someone out there in the fall, push that back up. Yeah, that's easy. We have the equipment for that. Okay. So, uh, you know, we might not do it as fast as you like or the way you like, but if we get out there and get it done, we'll get out there and get it done. Thank you. Other questions specific to the engineer and design? The back, sir, I'm coming to you. Your name, address, and your question. Dan Lane, 274 Central Ave. As a follow-up to my neighbor, Stan Nash's question on crossing over the river, I believe John responded that the access is only in one place. I'm 
you mean one place per household or one place per ten households? So the question uh, has to do with it, in this firm, if you're uh, if you have access over the firm, you're going to create a low spot, which was the initial question. And uh, what the concern is is if you know each household has people going over the firm, if that's going to create a low spot. No, it will, it will not. What I was referring to is if everybody was only going over one spot, and the one example is all the way at the north end. That that is certainly an example where you're certainly going to need to fix that before the next storm season. But in general, if you guys are going over your herbs, you're not going to change the elevation enough to, to make any difference. Thank you. Other questions on the design and the engineering? I'm with you, Mr. Gracie. Your name and your address? Bob Gracie, 180 Central Avenue. Would the, our gentleman, Mr. Jameson, could you just put a quick diagram that that will throw the cross section of on the board over there so we can see how far it would be from our houses, our decks. John Alden, if uh, you want to draw and I'll do my best. So uh, okay. so, so the verb and I'll I'll get out of the way here in a second. Um, so basically your your decks or your your, your homes I'm going to do a horrible job of drawing because this is not my forte. Uh, he's an engineer. I'm an engineer. I do everything in, on computers these days. So the burn itself, so, so the burn itself is, is going to basically, if you have a seawall, um, if you have a seawall in your house, it's going to go right up against your seawall. Um, if it's, uh, if you're on piles, you know, maybe some of the burn may encroach right between the edge of your piles and come up and fire your back. But again, it's basically your deck is going to be right behind. And again, this is not the scale. You know, the, the, the burn where you're kind of looking at it is probably going to be maybe 10 or 12 feet if, in front of your decks as it comes up. Um, and then it's going to be a few feet higher than your decks in general. Um, somebody had asked a question earlier about whether the elevation is going to vary depending on people's heights of their decks. No, it's not. Uh, this, this burn is designed to a specific elevation. And that's what we're going to stick it to. And, it, and, it, and we talked about um, you know, everything here. You start to look at your uh, feet elevations. A lot of the feet elevations are 15 or 16, is what the uh, what your houses are required to be built at. This top is at 19 relative to that. So in most cases, it's going to be about three feet um, above the elevation of your deck. If your deck's in the lowest uh, cord. Uh, for some people, your decks are actually a little bit higher, and you're going to be able to look right over the burn, and it's not going to be a problem. And some people are more closer to 15, and that's going to be about four feet per. Uh, but it is in that neighborhood, uh, four, four feet, three feet, two feet, is where the burn is going to stick up above the uh, elevation. The, 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 the top of the room might be 20 feet from the deck, or less, and then continue for 30 feet. It's flat. Correct. So we're, we're looking about 30 feet, yes, it's going to be 30 feet flat. And this may be, you know, it, it, again, it depends on the specific property, but this is probably going to be 20 to 25 feet in general. Could the public use that? Could the public use this? Um, it, it is in the footprint of the easement. Um, so it's it basically, it's, you know, from your, everything that's in the, in the easement, yes, they can use it technically, but I mean, people are not gonna, I, I can say from window, people don't walk across this. People walk on the shoreline and they're gonna be down, you know, after this, the coal race, they're gonna be down here. Um, so they're down on the front side of the beach. Again, the material that ends up creating on the top here is gonna end up being the cobbler portion. It's not pleasant to walk on. This is not something that people are gonna see the beautiful flat paved surface and want to walk down this 30 foot uh, sidewalk. This is going to be a very coarse, cobbly, loose material that's not pleasant to walk on. The material that you're going to want to walk on is the where you have kind of that sand gravel mix that you have now that people kind of walk along the beach.
beach for the upper part of the beach. So this is, again, it's, it's not conducive to making people happy for our, uh, a pathway. I guess if that's the question. And Bob, specifically, we're going to discuss uh, uh, what the easement would permit or not permit when we get to the easement section in a few minutes. Any other questions specific to engineering and design? Okay. Rich has another question. Just follow up. Rich, the only 26 Central. If you do have a seawall, the burn will stop at that height. The my seawall, according to my elevation plans, are like 15.6. So the cobble will stop there and go up to 19 feet. So I'm actually only, only walking up about 4 feet. Am I correct? So I, the one thing I will say is it sort of depends on what, whether you're at the end of the seawall or not. So if, in some cases, yeah, that would be correct. If you're closer to the end of the seawall, the burn may start uh, a little bit further away from your seawall. So you might have to walk up five or six feet. But it's not, you know, it's not going to be 40 feet. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, Any other questions about design and engineering? Back in the corner. Your name, your address, your question, sir. Rick from Steve, one of the I guess uh, my question has to do with what the slope when it's going down the water is going to be. So some of the houses that you go towards the cliff, the amount of distance from the water to the house is 50 feet. It's not very far. It's small and small. So the question is, if you're going to have a high slope where there is no beach for houses towards the cliff because it's so narrow, how do they maintain that slope? And is there going to be sand when you roll it out and go down towards the water? And it's more of a sand in nature. Is that going to be preserved? Or is it going to be really more like um, a small hollow? Uh, so the, the best answer to this is nature's great right sorter. So, um, you know, at the upper part of the corner, as I said, it is going to be cobbly. We are constructing this in a 1 to 4 to 1 to 5 slope. That doesn't mean anything from a non-engineer. But what I will say is, when we construct something, nature is going to push it kind of the way you see your pew now. It's going to be steep up at the top, and then it's going to tail down and get flatter and flatter, and also the material is going to get finer and finer. And, and to be honest with you, if you actually dug down in your beach, you would realize there's a lot of cobble underneath the sand. But in the summer, if there's a nice veneer of sand that comes in. That would be maintained. The veneer is going to come and go. You go there in the winter, it's a lot cobblier. In the summer, it's a lot sandier. That's just kind of that bar that sits offshore in the winter. You see it come back on in the summer. That's going to be maintained. But you know, I can't tell you exactly what your slope's going to be. It's going to be kind of the S curve after the waves uh, rework it. So it's going to be steep up at the top, get gradually flatter as you go out towards the water, just like you have now. Your beach will be wider. You know, this is obviously going to push the beach further seaward, and it's not going to, um, you know, I guess the fear is you create this part of this, it's going to drop straight into the water. That's not what's going to happen. It's going to go on that S curve, and the beach itself in front of that will maintain the weight that you see now. It's just going to be pushed further seaward. Any other final questions on design and engineering? Diane? And then, um, my question to you is, if the top of the cobble is, if the top of the cobble is out 30 feet, how far down does the slope go to the water? Because we don't have 30 or 40 feet at the opening of the cliff. You put that burn in there. That's not, we don't have enough, we don't have enough space to put something in. Right, so you, you don't have enough space now. I mean, this, this is pushing the sea back. You know, part of this project is pushing the sea back. So what we would be doing is pushing the shoreline, especially up the north end there, you're pushing it seaward, and that beach that you have now is basically going to naturally move with it. So when you push you push out your um, push out this worm, this worm is going into the water, especially at that end. And then the uh, you know basically everything that's there naturally reforms into the same beach you have, it's just further seaward than what you have now. 
So that's that's kind of like what when you're talking about these big church like down in North Carolina, etc., where you're actually, and that's the way Winthrop was done, where you're actually pushing the shoreline out a couple hundred feet in that case. Uh, but that's that is kind of a standard way of doing this. So I'm not just it's not gonna just you build, you build it and then it drops into a cliff. You build it and then the beach that's there will form into what it is now, just further seaward. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Doesn't? We don't have that much room. Mm -hmm. I understand. I, and I, I, I completely understand that. But we're, we're going to make that room by filling it. We're going to make that system by, by filling it. Stacy, any other question? Can you answer again, please? Stacy Clark, Tim Marshall Lab. I'm just curious whether there could be a natural material added to the forest sandstone and gravel to ensure its integrity for a longer period of time. I was just quickly Googling and I came up with the idea of clay. So I wonder, I don't know the answer. I don't know and I don't want to cut off the top. But just was wondering if long clay or even some sort of you know, this material could hold it all together. Well, one could ask, could uh, uh, seagrass naturally hold it together? No. Uh, um, these are all important questions. Um, as far as the, this concept, um, there is nothing that's going to hold together a beach uh, any better than the way it's held together. Um, for areas where you see, you're probably moving, uh, there's a lot, a lot of work like the salt marshes and stuff, very mild wave environments where you could try to enhance things by getting fine grain materials from tree. That's not what we're dealing with. This is really the only way that you would get this to last longer would be to bring in boulders to go to the paddle of the beach. And you know, if you go up by each of beach or something like that, you can see some of that. But here, naturally, that's not what's here and really is required, again, with the uh, regulatory, that what we do is we add what's compatible to the beach. And what's what you have compatible here is it's a cobble. And it, it lasts well as long as the volume is sufficient. Rich? I didn't want to fill up. In that same vein, um, could you also use some beach grass and such in the firm? It gives it. Uh, uh, I would think that it's some more stability and uh, perhaps it softens the, the look of the body. Uh, so uh, generally, if, if grass comes in, it's fine. The one thing I, I would like to stress and keep in mind is that because this is an engineer burn, and I kind of go sort of back to the mantle example, uh, the one thing you want to be able to do is be able to drain this and bring it back to volume. And you know, once you start getting native vegetation established, um, you know, that kind of starts becoming an issue with the Wellness Protection Act. Um, and, and the, the amount of good that it does in a firm of this type of rain size is so minimal that you know, you're, not, you're not really trying to creep in the the sand like you do on a sand dune. So it really doesn't have much of an effect. Coming back to Mr. Petty once again. New York City again, we'll see you again. For a Fed 1894, I got a question. Seawalls, some pretty dramatic seawalls are being constructed in Moscow and the city. Is the reason that can't be done in the Hummer is because it's a very beach or is there any reason why this Moscow is, is building pretty, pretty substantial seawalls? which would naturally build up a barren beach because the water and stones won't be going over. It's situated to do it also. I, I don't understand why that has ever been approached to this much more. Um, it, it actually has been discussed in, in quite a bit of detail, and that goes back to the 2016 report. There is an issue because it is a barrier beach, uh, technically through regulatory is prohibited. But that's not really the only issue. I've I been mean, I deal with a lot of projects in a lot of parts of the state. And one thing I will say is, you know, it's kind of what Marshfield's going through. They are fixing their seawalls. They have incredible repetitive loss damage. 
and it's not getting any better whether they raise their sea walls or not. Um, that, that's a, a very tenuous, uh, it, it, it gives you a false sense of security, I think is the, the real answer to that. Um, you know, if, um, I, I guess if that were a great long-term solution, uh, I, I think that we would have already seen it now. Where we do have seawalls, and I actually could point out Winthrop example, Winthrop wants a seawall. That's, and now it's, you know, now it's a nourishment project. That's the same as Revere Beach. These are both seawalls, and over time what ends up happening is, uh, as the seawalls prevent the erosion of the upland, the uh, beach gets lower and lower in front of the seawall, bigger and bigger waves are allowed to attack that seawall, you're forced to raise the seawall, at some point the old seawall gets undermined, the cost gets excessive, and you know you guys are worried about not being able to see over your berm. I can tell you there are places where the sea the sea walls are getting so high you can't see over them, and they're really not. You know, I mean, they're not the panacea solution that, that a lot of people are, are. You know, they're more of a quick fix at this point. They're really uh, at the point where in Marshfield and in places such like Hall, where there are sea walls. Um, yes, the easiest thing to do is just kind of bandage them up and, and fix them. But where there aren't seawalls, it's really better to do other things because um, it is something that is not going to last and certainly creates a long, longer, longer term problem that's more and more expensive to fix. Going into that. Once again, everybody wants water. Get out of water. Don't want anybody to come behind you. Uh, your name and address the person is? Uh, Nora Blaney, 274 Central Ave. Um, my thought is, how is one going to get up the berm and then down the other side to the beach? Is it like firm? I mean, we have rocks in front of our house and I slid down the other day, so I'm just wondering. I, I have a beauty of a job that I, what I do is walk beaches, so um, I feel for it. Um, but you know, the one thing I will say, uh, for these types of beaches, one thing to be, uh, because it is loose material, um, and the berm, it, you know, any of this material is loose, and that's why people want to walk down the rest of it. But if you have, uh, if you want to get across it, and you're having a hard time, they, there are a lot of mats that, that are made that you can easily roll out in the summer and, and get across this. And uh, I know there's a bunch of manufacturers that do that. They're not perfect, but you know, they certainly would make it more tolerable. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think an example of that is that the uh, public beach here is uh, Hum Rock. Uh, that th those things are like turbo thick and work incredibly well as an example. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm closer here than I'll be right over there now. Your name and address is. Carrie Grasha, 238. Um, we're using this project in the park. This worked. Um, the distance from the top of the room to the homes in Winthrop is it similar to the distance that this project is going to be? I have to say no, it's not. Uh, in that project, uh, one of the things they wanted to do is they wanted to move, you know, it, it's a beach nourishment and the perm project. So that beach nourishment was actually very wide before we get to the perm. So it's about, it's actually about 100 feet before the perm even starts. Um, so that, that, if you, and again, if you're flying to Boston and you're, you see the Five Sisters with spray waters, that's the beach you're looking at. That, that beach is very wide now. Um, and so it wasn't really um, cut in the exact same manner as this, but it serves the same purpose and the same type of material. Come to you now. Your name and your address, please, and then your question. So my name is Catherine Doran. I'm at 38 Pitt Road, so I'm up on Forest Pitt. So um, my property is on the ocean side. Right now it's protected by a wall and by some rather poorly maintained riprap. So my question is, what is the bird going to do to the properties that are on the ocean side of Forest Pitt? Um, is sand going to migrate to that area or not? And why couldn't the um, borer be ex extended to protect our properties as well? Um, so 
so uh, you know, this is an issue with, with, with Fort Flip itself. Um, so again, what our focus was was to look at what we consider a repetitive loss frame. So this is where FEMA and other people have had a lot of flood damage. And so that's what the areas we're focused on protecting. So we were looking at Fort Flip itself, uh, homes up there actually having sustained any damage as, as far as FEMA claims go. Uh, I understand that the web is not in great shape, um, but at the same time, that was sort of outside of our purview because it, it is, I believe it's a, a, it's a well, part of its Air Force and, and it's unclear whether part of its town or private. There, there was some debate on that, but I, again, I haven't studied it, so I'm not going to get into the details of that. But the one thing I will say is that there will be some material migrates in that direction as you get closer to the north end, the, the Saturn transport from the beach does move to the north, so there, there is going to be certain sun material. It might raise the beach a bit, but I would not consider it something that's going to provide too much protection. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm from I live at 32 Cliff Road. Okay. Um, I've been there for 25 years. Um, my deed says that my property stops at the base of the cliff, which means it does not include the revetment. It does not. And all of these north of the opening say the same thing, the second. Yet the town has repaired the revetment twice using FEMA money. Why can't we have that happen again? Since you repaired it, who repairs it? Don't you kind of own it? If you spent that those 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 uh, that work was over three hundred thousand dollars, and FEMA paid eighty percent. So why don't we get a hold of FEMA and say, come back in and help us? So are you these are questions specific to our benefits or this entire project? I think it has a lot to do with the entire project. Okay. Um, when do we cover that during the easement component? Fair question, but we'll cover that in the easements. Unless you guys don't want to talk about easements. Uh, any final question before we move on to easements? All right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dave. Dave Conti, 282 Cent for that. How often do you expect it to be uh, needing repairs? You know, is it five years? Is it ten years? What is your assessment? Uh, so the assessment is, uh, it depends on storm frequency. So if we had a winter like we had two winters ago, no work would need to be done. If we had a winter like we had last winter, we're going to need to do some repairs. So I, in general, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, that there might be some repairs of the type where we're just regrading something in a couple of spots, maybe on an annual basis that the town can do very easily. Um, and then maybe once every four or five years, there might be, need to be some more material brought in. So um, again, we, we anticipate those being relatively minor compared to the initial construction, something in the order of 5% of the material. So, um, I, one more question on design. Lisa. Lisa Case, 242 Central Ave. Um, you made a point saying that the town focused on competitive loss flood claims based on the length of where you're going to uh, phase one. Is that correct? Okay. How, 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 how does phase one then determine? Uh, so we, we determined the, the whole length of the project uh, based on um, FEMA flood claims. So, so that's the entire length. So we looked at that area as being the area we want to focus on. As far as the uh, second area, as we looked at uh, cost. So, so we were looking at something that's within the kind of the state grant realm of, I believe, 3.5 to $4 million total that you can get from the state in like a dam and seawall type grant. And so that's uh, the extent of what that extended to was, was around where your house is. And that is, um, uh, that area 
the most northerly area is by far the most heavily damaged, and that's also the area we're most concerned about breach happening, so we focus on doing that north half of the project first. Let me see if there's any other questions before I go to anybody else. I understand that in keeping with the, the ground rules, I want to make sure that other people also have a question that. All right, so based on what you just said, the beach nourishment is going to go to 244, which is a house on islands. There will be a gap between that house and ours, which is on the foundation. The velocity of water that will come through there will be tremendous, because as that gap fills up, when it is filled by trucks depositing material in there, and it narrows, the water comes through more intensely, and then it also beats away at our retaining wall because there's a very little space for the water to come through. Would it be better to make the break of phase one with two houses on piling so it's like equal, the water would come? underneath rather than impacting a whole series of houses on the foundations. Which by the way is a lot of water that comes in the water. Um, so the, the reason why that actually is a good spot for us to end it is because there are no foundations. You have basically a seawall type thing we didn't end the project there so that it's not a soft place to end it. If I ended in a house earlier, I think what your concern is when it actually happened. I would be creating kind of a, a spot where the water would want to flow right into that one, one house. If I'm ending it at a seawall, it's actually a better location. And the one thing I want to point out, even though we're building this berm and it looks like it's this perfectly static um, feature, some of it's going to migrate. The first storm that happens, that material is going to end up being pushed over to where you're all this anyways in, in, in front of it and that burn will form in front of that stretch of, of seawalls that are right there. So you know we looked at it as ending it at the where the, the seawall started as actually a, a good termination point. And we don't think that that's going to create a channel of flow because we think that that's going to, you know, the, the burn is very high and it's going to fill right in there and you know the next section would be a, a section that's already has at least some level of higher protection from seawalls, from that water elevation, but not necessarily from uh, you know, overwash. No, uh, because it naturally migrates there, and you not need to use it for that. I, I just want clarification. So if that burn goes up to the seawall, you're putting it on our property. But you don't need an easement from us to put it on this section between their property and the seawall? Again, I, I think I'd have to see what the details of your lot lines are. But I mean, you know, we can certainly work on something out and if an easement required for that, then we would need an easement for that. Um, but again, you know, the idea would be to end the project right at the seawall. And if that goes uh, uh, some distance on your property, then that is a moving part. Hold on, sir. Hold on. Hold on. And so that gives you a good place where you can start again, bringing the fell on. Why don't we transition to the easement uh, uh, topic, if that's okay with everybody. Um, also, uh, you were bumping up against when the schedule closes. We're not going to close the meeting. That's what we're on. He's kind enough to uh, let us stay. I will say before we leave, if everybody could take his or her chair and stack it against that table over there, it will save everybody a lot of time, especially Bob. So, uh, so he's kind of let us say uh, over time, so uh, we want to help him out as well. Um, how we're going to do this? Um, already sent electronically and also distributed hard copy uh, is a easement cover letter as well as the easement itself. I've asked for uh, current to read the cover letter, and I think Brad then is going to be reading the easement. Then we're going to get into the questions and answers. So we need to understand exactly what the cover letter and the easement do say. Then we're going to get into the written questions. Then we're going to take questions from the audience. 
Thank you, Keith. Um, as a result of the June 25th meeting, several of you that were at that meeting uh, came down to express some concerns with regards to the effective date of an easement, with regards to starting the project, as well as maintaining the project. So uh, we conferred with town council, and actually that those types of criteria are not proper for an easement. That's a lawyer speaking. I'm just telling you what we've been advised by our town council. But she did advise that putting those uh, pieces of criteria into a cover letter that would accompany your easement and also be filed along with the easement at the registry of deeds would be an appropriate way to handle your concerns. So um, we collectively constructed a cover letter and I will read it. Blind. Dear homeowner, you are receiving this communication because your property will be part of the Hummer Rock Beach Nourishment Project. As a part of this project, the town will create a new beach that will serve as a storm reduction barrier in front of homes along Central Avenue in Hummer Rock. As a condition of using state and federal funds, and to be eligible for FEMA reimbursement in the event of future storm damage, the area must be open to the public. Consequently, you are being asked to grant the town an easement deed which will allow the town to perform the necessary beach nourishment and will also allow public access to the beach. Once the project is completed, the town will maintain the new beach area or otherwise perform any act relative to the easement area as specified in any town beach nourishment project permit subject to available funding. You are being asked to execute the easement deed at this time so the town can proceed with the necessary funding for the project from the state and federal governments. However, the town will hold the deed and will not record it until and unless the town receives the requisite funding for the project. Kindly review the attached easement deed. Once you have done so, kindly execute the deed and return it to the Office of the Board of Selectmen at 600 Chief Justice Cushing Highway. Attention to Michelle Sadeke. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any comments or concerns. I am optimistic that we will be able to work together to improve and preserve Home Rock Beach for the future. And we actually should have had Jim read it. This says, Mr. James Pedro, Town Administrator. Jim paid me five bucks for you to read it. Uh, then the easement itself, um, uh, I've asked Brad to review it and, and read it aloud so everybody's on the same page. Great. Um, if you were following along with the letter, please read this since I read it to you, as a lot of it is in legalese, um, and I don't want to lose anyone. So, blank and blank, what you do, um, here and after referred to as the grantors, owners of the property at X Central Ave in Situate, from the county of Massachusetts, here and referred to as the property grant of the town of Situate, a municipal corporation with offices at 600 Chief Justice Fishing Highway, Central Mass, here and after referred to as the grantee or town, for nominal consideration of less than $100, and easement, as more particularly described herein, moving along for good and valuable consideration, the receipt and sufficiency of which is expressly acknowledged, the grantors hereby voluntarily grant quick claim covenants and convey to the grantee town for itself and as held on behalf of the general public a perpetual, non-exclusive right and easement to use the easement area as defined below, in common with grantor and others who now or hereafter are entitled thereto. A. A temporary construction easement in the area between the existing and restored Upland Beach area, between the lot lines, mean high water line, and the entire nourished area. B. A permanent B. Okay. Um, the permanent easement area and the easement area, both shown as blank on the attached exhibit A for the purposes of constructing 
replacing beneficial reuse of fresh material, beach nourishment, replenishment, reconstruction, replacement, maintenance and repair of the nourished area in the eastern area, as well as the right to cross and recross the Grand Doors property for such purpose. And C, a permanent easement in the eastern area for the public use of the beach, for typical beach uses including sitting, walking, swimming, and fishing, except there shall be no public use of lawfully existing, currently or in the future, structures or enclosures expressly allowed pursuant to any law, license, and permit. Turning the page over, uh, the rights hereby reserved and granted, authorized, but do not impose any obligation upon the town to maintain or otherwise perform any act relative to the easement area, other than those acts specified in any town beach project permit subject to available funding. For grantors title CD report of the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds, and the booking page, um, and then there's an executed as sealed instrument that's stay out when you memorize it. Um, and below is just a uh, So you've heard, excuse me, in the uh, cover letter, you've heard uh, the easement language. <clears throat> We're now going to go through the questions that are on the printed sheets that have been distributed. Question, why are easements required for this project? There are two types of easements that will be required as outlined in the easement document. The first is the temporary construction easement. Um, and this covers the footprint of the proposed project and is required for construction access. Um, secondly, the permanent easement uh, allowing maintenance and public access to the covering the project footprint in areas below meet high water. Um, this will be required for the town to seek other, fu other public funding sources, including federal and state grants, uh, to complete the project. Other governmental agencies, including the Army Corps of Engineers, FEMA, Mass DEP, require these public easements if these public funding sources are used for the project. I did want to just add a quick note. Um, Mass General Law, Chapter 91, the waterways regulations uh, already permit transient public access for fishing, etc., below meet high water on private property. This type of access that currently exists does not constitute full public access, and therefore direct material from publicly funded dredge projects to be used as nourishment on private beaches requires this full public access. Second question, will the town commit to long-term maintenance of the proposed berm? As included in the cover letter that Mara just read, um, that will accompany the easement agreement, the town will adhere to the requirements included in applicable project permits, including those for long-term monitoring and maintenance of the mix set of the berm, subject to available funding. Do all the homeowners need to sign an easement for the project to move forward? Yes. To complete the full project as proposed, all of the homeowners will need to sign an easement. The project will be phased, but will still require signing easements from the homeowners within the entire project phase. What is the timeline to sign the easements? Originally, the town indicated a September 1st deadline for the signed easements. This deadline was created to allow a reasonable amount of time to collect signatures prior to the end of the summer season and to keep the project on a reasonable timeline to advance the project into the permitting phase. In order to make sure that the residents are aware of and comfortable with the proposed easement language, additional time will be required. The town would like to obtain the signed easements by October 1st so we can advance the project and proceed to permitting. What will you do with my easement after I sign it? Uh, as included in the cover letter, uh, the will accompany the easement agreement, the town will hold the easement until it moves forward with the nourishment project. After the project is fully permitted and funded, the town will record the easements with the registry of deeds prior to commencement of any construction activities. Will the easements permit people to move in an east-west direction through my property in order to get to the beach? So in other words, they quote unquote park on Central Avenue and work, walk in an easterly direction to gain access to the beach. Easy one? No. There you go. 
how will people gain access to the beach? Through the currently designated public access areas. Last of the real questions. Will someone be able to park on the street in front of or near my home in order to get to the beach? No, no additional public parking will be developed. If someone parks legally, they can be ticketed by the police. So, you've heard the cover letter, you've heard the easement itself, you've heard the questions and answers, you want to open up to the floor. Bob, your name and address. Bob Turner, 6185. Uh, my question is, can you describe to us and show us what the easement area is as defined in the uh, easement B? Uh, so if anyone did hear uh, the question is, uh, could uh, someone draw what the easement area technically is? So perhaps we can utilize this. So if this is the constructed berm here, we can uh, maybe highlight what the easement area is. Each home will have its own separate easement. We'll be engineered for that particular home based upon your property line and where the berm's going to go. But in a general sense, what we're building is the easement area. The berm that we're building is the easement area that we're looking for. And then, of course, it's a temporary easement for the construction, but that goes away from the dump. Generally, the berm that we're building is the easement area. Other questions? Uh, so, Keith, do we put his hand up? Any address, please? Open 128 Central Avenue. As you show that still that sketch right there, it shows the easement, but not on the path. And I'm wondering if the town really wants this project, if they're willing to negotiate some conditions. Uh, specifically, specifically, some buffer zone between the front door and the public access. Uh, some restrictions on fires, alcohol, food, dogs, things like that. It, it doesn't cover uh, near enough to protect people. And I can't imagine what the signing of the I'm guessing that the current laws and statute would fall in place for all that. Jim discussed that. In terms of the easement being under your deck, this is just a bad picture. Don't let engineers draw pictures if I can't make do it. So your house is going to have a different easement than everybody else's house based upon where your property lines. But John correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think in any cases extending out of the deck. In terms of fires, alcohol, dogs, they're already all regulated. I don't think we allow dogs on the beach sometimes. Uh, on leases and after certain hours, fires are by permit, alcohol is not allowed. Before I come back to you, I just want to make sure that we uh, keep asking uh, any other chance questions. questions. Uh, Mr. Perfetti, Bob will do that also. Mark Perfetti, I'm tonight in close and tall. Last question. On the cover letter, there's a condition of using state federal funds to be eligible being to be reimbursed. Where, so if this, if I don't sign it, I can't get insurance from the FEMA. I mean, that's what it's saying. I think they didn't need it that way because it's, it's, it's basically saying it's part of the condition that if we don't, FEMA reimbursement in the event of future storms, the beach has to be open to the public. The beach is open to the public now. So if, if we don't sign the easement, I'm reading this, it could be reading it wrong, but I don't think so. That we will no longer be eligible for being insurance. That's what it's about. If you want me to read the cover letter, but the fever is the reimbursement if something happens to the burn of the application. Our private property is not reimbursed by FEMA for a storm. So that beach has to be public in order for us to get reimbursed if we have to go out there and make so it has nothing to do with your individual home or flood insurance. That's a question. Um, 
here, and I'll come back to you in a second now. Uh, I go on to 28 Central Avenue. Could you tell us how many people have actually signed the easement so far? The answer was about a half a dozen or so. Um, understand that the person who is managing this um, has left uh, the, the town in the last uh, few weeks, so. Where are rich and promises? We'll be down here. You need to address it. Uh, Denise Robinson, the first cell. Just have a clarification on me. Um, how will people get access to the beach? It says through the property that's made the public access area. That's right next to my house, so is that? But if people just come there now anyway. People can walk the off and use it. <coughs> then if I'm going to have more people coming and using that right away from my house. I would expect to have more people coming through, as John's explained. We're not building a we're not building a beach for people to come to. We're building a park, so it's not going to be any more attractive or unattractive than it is to people now. For most people, the public access to Hum Rock is right in the center. That's what people know. People coming down there, uh, you know, and I know do. A lot of them probably coming off both cliff also. But this is not going to be a place where people are going to drive from everywhere and say, oh my god, oh my god, I'm on beach. It's got great deep sand. It's, it's going to be a, a park. I promise first to go next to Bob, I'll be back to you. Which towards the 10 mile trail out, how many uh, signatures are required to have the project process? I mean, how many? What number? I, I believe there are 36 houses in the first phase, I may be wrong, but, and I think there were some in the order of high 90s, low 90s, well, probably. And then a different answer to that? Okay. Bob, I promise you I'll be coming your way. Bob Turner, Shakespeare Lady Drive. So, my house um, is on uh, a foundation. It looks very much like the uh, sketch that uh, you have up, up there. And I have a seawall that's uh, currently at about the same level. And I have a burn in front of the house that maybe goes up two or three feet above that and extends out. So, based on what I'm here now, if this project goes forward, from my seawall forward would be public property. So that people could go north south, not east west. I understand that. But they could go north south across the dirt, two feet from my seawall, and that's public property. Where now I have private property down to the mean my watermark, which is, I don't know, let's say 100 feet or so. So I'm giving up all that land between my seawall and the Mehan waterway. If this goes through as public property, people may not want to walk on it, as you say, but they could walk on it, they could bring the dogs, on the beach, like they, any legal activity that's not allowed on the beach, people could do that within one or two feet of my like, current seawall. Is that correct? I'll also ask uh, for some commentary on it becoming public property versus public having an access to it. I think there's a difference. Uh, I do have to say that that is generally correct. But again, uh, it is an uncomfortable place to walk. I will say it's not going to be a place where you want to walk along the beach. Um, it, you know, I, I can see it's not really that big an issue to go over the top of it from your home. But I, you know, again, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that it's not going to be right next to your house because it is. Um, but it is something that is going to be relatively uncomfortable and probably not something that people would want to be in. Um, and again, um, again, at least speaking from the projects I work on, um, I can say that whether there's public access or not, uh, you know, people don't change the way they behave. 
Um, you know, because I think that right now we have people walk up and down the beach every time I'm there. And I know that they can't camp out now. And this allows them to put down a towel out on the beach. But I mean, people don't want to walk a mile to go and pop down a towel. Um, you know, if they're going to go, they're going to go to probably be one of the at public entrances, or you know, they don't like to drag coolers a while on the beach. So if the access doesn't really exist now, they're going to be walking along the beach, and the area that they walk along is generally the same kind of area they walk along now. But they do have permission, not, you know, they don't own the beach, but there is a permission that they would have to use the entire thing. Bob Briggs in 180 Central Avenue. Will you name for us the sort of the public access areas? So Bob's question is please define what are the public access areas for Hamara. Anybody? And that could also be a follow-up action item. Uh, uh, yeah. That'd be good. I, I believe it's Bartlett Road, um, so it comes up off of, you know, where Atlantic comes around. That's one public access. We talk about the public access all the way north end. Those are basically the only two uh, public access uh, locations on the beach, at least official. CDU Avenue is one. CDU Avenue, yes. We can also make a note as uh, Dave is kind of taking uh, you know, notes of, of what's being said here that uh, you know, we can uh, generate that. Thank you. Let's get your name and address. Linda Barrett, 296 Central Ave. Um, if we are giving up our private ownership of a large percentage of our land, what kind of tax ramifications are there? If we pay exorbitant taxes now and the majority of it is for land not the dwellings and we're giving up half of that with our tax rate for the own halfway what the board started over this is the tax rate doesn't change your assessment bank that's going to be after the board of assessments again on a case-by-case -case basis they would have to look at your property and revalue to determine whether it's worth what it's worth we do that every three years now. You know your problem. But if you, as any taxpayer now, if you believe your taxes are, your assessment's too high, you can apply for a bank. Anybody can do it. Just keep going, Brad. This gentleman had his hand up several times. Any interest, please? Stan Blaney, 274 Central Line. The last three questions that were responded to will let us ease the effect from the people to move east, west, south. And the three questions there. Could you specifically look at these tax act agreement and see what that is specifically addressed? To because um, it isn't in my opinion, um, I provided language that I thought was acceptable to the government and I fixed it. They provided that also to the land after last night's uh, staff meeting. Okay, thank you. Would you like to jump into the repeated question? Yeah, the language is in the current easement. Yeah, the language that you provided last night currently or in the future is what we have in the revised easement, which you have before you right now. This is, did, did that answer the question? I just want to come back to it. Maybe the question that you asked her wasn't understood completely. Can you see that nice and loudly? Yeah, so. So the three questions were, Will the easement permit people to move in an east-west direction through my property in order to get to the beach? No. How will people get gain access to the beach? Through the currently designated public access areas. Will someone be able to park on the street in front of the area hall in order to go to the beach? No. No additional parking will be developed. If something parks illegally, this can be ticketed by the police. In the current language that's in there, it specifically references that there's a if the land around the, 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 the structure is there that people can't go through that. But what if the structure is not there? It's not really addressed. I, I think I just have to say. 
correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying if there's some sort of opening between houses, someone could go through there. Is that kind of what you're saying? There's no structure or something that people could access from the road to the beach? That, that's the case. Yeah. Okay. We don't have easement on that. So that still belongs to and is under the control of whoever owns it, it's under their control now. So if you don't want people to walk through there, you don't let them walk through there. The, the easement does not extend through your property to the street. I mean, is that making myself clear or am I making it both reasons? So, well, the language at the end of the easement specifically. Hold on, sir. Hold on, sir. Just want to make sure everybody hears it. The language in the easement specifically relates mentions the building that's there. The structures that would be within the easement. So are you saying that basically that exhibit A is going to be that specific area? So I think what Jim is saying is that the easement zone doesn't include the space between the houses. Between the homes. There's no going to be no easement on that. It's going to be where the berm is constructed. So the public wouldn't have access to and through the area that isn't included in the easement. So structure. So when you're talking a structure within the easement area, you're talking someone might have a dock or a pier. It really doesn't happen up here. But the easement area is where we're building that firm. That's not where your home is or where your garage is or where your decks are. So when you talk about structures, there's structures within the easement area, which is the berm. Between the houses. Who's talking about between the houses? Right. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to say. I like to draw. With the easement area is out here where we're constructing the berm. That's where the easement area is. That's where we're talking. When you're talking about structures within the easement area not being open to the public, you're talking structures that would be in here, like a dock or a pier or something like that. I don't believe there are any of those along the whole length, but still it was in the easement. Well, none of this is part of the easement. This is, this is all property controlled and kept by whoever it is. If you want, you know, you let neighbors walk through, it's up to you. If you don't want people to walk through, it's up to you. spent a little bit of time with the applicants too. Yeah, and, and Jim just offered, um, if anybody, and, and I'll speak for everybody up here who can be incredibly, incredibly receptive to me personally, um, to go and see them, talk to them, call them, um, and, and be able to work through some really detailed questions if appropriate. Um, I think I think you asked the question two seconds ago, so I'm going to come back over here and come back at you. Keith. Uh, it's been said that FEMA requires this public access, and how come we didn't have to sign these easements with FEMA pay for uh, the sacrificial building that we all allow? All I can tell you is, in order to get FEMA reimbursement now, it has to be a public asset. I can't tell you what it did before, I can tell you that's what it is now. Because we had instances down on the water, down the ocean side, where private equipment was left along the beach and they were working on the seawall. That equipment was destroyed, not eligible for the FEMA reimbursement that we get. So when we go out and fix that dune, we fix that seawall, we get 75% reimbursement from FEMA to do that work. Because it's public work. There's other FEMA money for private, I don't know about it, but if the town does the work, 75% reimbursement has to be public. We'll come back uh, right here, sir, and then I'll go to you, and then I'll go to the But maybe you have the same question. Kyle Acker, 228 Central Ave. No, I, I just wanted to say that back in uh, the no name spot, I had major damage, and then we were pushing the beach up for probably like 10 years which you couldn't do, but we pushed it up every year. So we had a berm, like four houses in a row got together, and the berm worked. We never had a problem. The only time I had a problem is if we didn't push it up, like, you know, after they stopped it, which I can understand that, but 
When the Prama is there, the definitely works. So that was a statement, not a question, and probably fit under the um, uh, engineering and design. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, go ahead, Gene Ackerman, 248 Central. My thing is, we're all seriously, uh, I want to sign this. Okay, I want to sign this um, easement agreement, but we're all basically um, independent in Hamrock, and I think our thing is, is the town is going to get in our business more so. Like, right now, you really can't. We follow you know, our own rules, kind of, but you know, no one gets caused any trouble. But when we do the easement, we suddenly want to, the town is going to be in our business. Go ahead. <laughs> no. I think I got enough things I gotta take care of without adding more people's business. So no. You know, we'll we'll have to keep track of the firm what conditions it's in. I'm um, sure you'll be letting us know what kind of condition it's in. We won't have to come out and take a look at it. But in terms of being in your business and being down here to walk out of the firm and check it, no, we we've got to stop it. So there won't be any situation type drones. Um, Pam, I'm going to come back to you, and then we're going to keep going. Uh, Denise Robinson, Central Perth South. I have a question, though. If it's not maintained, will we then get everything back? And I do have the papers from the, uh, the sacrificial dirt firm that was signed. I have the easement from that, and it automatically went back to us because it wasn't maintained. That's, that's, I'd love to see that in this. If you don't maintain it, it says that for a reasonable amount of time back to us. That's all we're asking because, as I said, the bird crack and stuff has not been maintained really well, and so no one seems to know who owns it, but it, that's a you know, real scary thought to me. It's not going to heat everything up and then it's going to be maintained. And I have no reason. Thank you. Couple things. Let's have a copy of it. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, but before you go, I'll send it to me either way. I don't want to take your only copy. If I take your only copy, I'll definitely lose it. Sean did, Sean did without my picture. And so the easement is on what we're building. So if that goes away, I don't have an easement on anything because it's not there anymore. Okay, so I know that's kind of hard to understand. We're building this perm. That perm, that's what we have the easement on, the perm. The perm's not there anymore. What do I have these from? There's nothing left. But again, give me the deed, we'll take a look at it on the white house. In terms of maintaining it, I can tell you the March storm, we had four front end loaders, two bulldozers, and two rock trucks at over $250 an hour per piece of equipment. So it was about $2,000 an hour for more than three days to get through the fourth level. Putting money in the budget on a regular basis to do the little maintenance things on the firm that need to be done is probably going to be cheaper than having to get all that equipment down here on a regular basis to clean. When we say it's subject to appropriation, because everything we do is subject to appropriation. So if you come in and say, geez, it needs to be done, I have to tell you, I have to go to town meeting and get the money. I don't have it. We don't have pockets of money that we can just access and do things like that. But the long term for the town, it's probably cheaper to maintain the burn than it is to keep coming back and clean it up. So, but send me the language, uh, let me have a copy tonight, we'll take a look at it. Okay, well, I was in here, Rich. Yeah, Rich Field, 286 Central. I pushed the town pretty hard on the two subjects at hand here. A, the need of a permit, and B, getting the permit back if they don't maintain the burn. I have a copy of the letter that I received today um, from the town council. I wrote a three-page paper, um, appointed it to friends in town hall, um, but I wanted the answers about the need of, of an easement. Well, I don't necessarily agree 100% with the public money for public benefit is the only argument to be made. That is what we're that basically we're left with. I went to the selectmen last night, and basically it's an easement or we're not going to do it. So it really comes down to you folks deciding whether it's worth giving up that private beach, which in my mind isn't going to change much, other than the, the look of it, but the walking on it, 
the dog walking every day is not going to change. Um, people are going to just show up at Hard Rock Beach because of these new best signs. And it's magically out there that you want to go to Hard Rock now because now it's a public beach. People today don't know it's public. People out in some easement don't know it's public. It really is invisible. So that part of it for me, and it's a personal opinion, is we need to sign easement if we want to move forward. I will second the lady in the back, I don't know her name, that I would like to see something that if you don't maintain the, the easement, and the beach goes back to the profile it is today, or a symbol like that, that the easement will go away. I think that's fair. If you don't want to come back to my property to fix my, fix the, the burn of the easement for it, then you don't need the easement. So I would ask the board, and I mentioned this last night at the Board of Talk Committee, that I'd like to see that language included. So that's my comment to you as your neighbor. Uh, if you don't do something in Humble Rock, we're not going to have Humble Rock. And I don't really see that this is going to change the everyday coming and going of the general public to all of a sudden want to be on Humble Rock Beach. So that's my opinion. Thank you. We're going to have a signing party. Um, Keith, you've asked the questions. Let me just see if there's a, a few others in the audience who may have a question. And this is your first question. Name and address, please. Uh, basically, 25 Cliff Road, I guess. <laughs> After that, if this doesn't get signed by all the homeowners, which I don't know how realistic that is, I haven't talked to everyone and I don't know, but if it doesn't get signed, so we don't get the raised road, and we don't get the firm, is there a plan B? Is there any? We lose the money. Well, 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 let's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there would be no continuation of any other types of studies or, or trying to do something else. It has to be the firm or nothing. Here you go. The answer that it has to be the berm or nothing is, is an engineering question. The berm is what is going to work. So to do something else, other things are more expensive, other than that, we don't know if they'll work as well. I go by the engineers on that. They tell me this is what's going to work. If we don't get, this is not like the seawall project. If you're on Oceanside Drive, the new seawall is about three feet higher than the old seawall. And you see the new seawall, and all of a sudden it drops three feet. You see the old seawall. I look back up to the new seawall. Those homes in between did not give us easements to the new seawall. So we, we skipped them. We can't do that in this project. We can't skip a house. So yes, we have to have all the easements. I can tell you, a lot of those people on the side drive have since come back to us and said, we get the seawall? No. Right on it. We're spent it. We're done. Uh, but you can go down there and see where the water was coming in for the new seawall around the edge. So, unfortunately on this project, we can't pick and choose to skip. We have to have all the easements to do it. Plan B is exactly what we're doing now. The storms will come in. We'll come down. We'll clean up as quickly and as best as we can. We'll put back what we put back and it'll happen again. Keith? Keith, do want to come in such a way as I understood what you just said, the easement applies to the area of the burn. How does that affect uh, the land that we own east of the burn? East or west? Did you say east, seaward, or towards the burn? Seaward, okay, east. I don't think it would impact at all. The public already has certain rights in that title land. Right. Navigation fishing following. So I can sit there and I can go with a shotgun and a fishing rod. Stay there. You can't touch me. But they already have that right there, so I don't think the easements extend that far. I have to look here and see the actual paperwork. But it wouldn't change what you have out there right now. We're talking about what we're building. Any other questions on easements before we wrap this up? I know it's getting late. Diane? Diane, I'd like to know if the town is going to make a concerted effort to get those 35 or 36 
people to sign the damn easement to save the beach. That's important. They're not here. There aren't 35 people here. And they weren't at the last meeting or the meeting before, because I didn't want to all. So I'll answer it from my perspective, and I certainly love to get some of the town officials to answer it. On Sunday, I hand-delivered 100 of the agendas to every single house up and down, and I've seen many of you. And by the way, I'm the guy who walks the dogs. Every day, too, of which day's four, so I look a little different when I have my Gettysburg College stuff on. Um, so I hand-delivered 100. I did. I went to get in. If they were home, if they were sitting outside, I didn't say, honey, come on, can I come in for a cup of coffee? Right? Diane asked that question. Did, uh, Diane asked why aren't they here. I, I, I don't know if it's a short answer. And it's up to them. And it's up to us as the town. We are the town to have these conversations with our neighbors, to have them understand. That's why we've gone to great lengths to have this as an open Q&A forum that's being videotaped that will be on YouTube. If somebody says, ah, darn, I just couldn't get here, that's fine. They'll take two hours and 10 minutes of their lives to watch, hopefully, the video. And if they don't, shame on all of us. There's only so much we all can do, but hopefully with strength in numbers and why Chris uh, Brown, out in front of Hobby Rock Gibbs, posted the sign on Saturday as outside the post office in the Hobby Rock Boathouse, uh, had it front and center, and as soon as people walked in, hey, let's talk about this. Um, so why is somebody not here? If you know them, please ask them. I don't know. Um, let me see if there's another town res official town response before I go to the next question. I can say that uh, for the seawall project, we did have to make a concerted effort and knock on doors and really explain it, um, which I'm certainly willing to work with Brad and the team to do that as well. Um, but like Keith said, what happened on Oceanside Drive is that uh, the Coastal Coalition was also incredibly helpful. Now, I don't know who the mover and shakers are down here in Hummel Rock. Who are those influencers, right, aside from Keith and a couple of folks who have been so kind to organize this. But, but Keith, as he said, you know, migrate south. So um, I, I would say maybe the next step is to kind of identify an influencer. That's what we need. Someone who can accompany us, knock on the door, and say, guys, we, we need to sign this. It's imperative. We want to move forward. We're coming at the end of the project to either where the rubber hits the road, that we're moving forward or we're not. And I think that is what really needs to be explained. We're willing to put the energy in to do that. Stacy. Stacy Clark, to your point, um, this diagram and the discussion has been so helpful to me because I did not understand that it was A, only the easement, separate from the house and property surrounding the house that was part of the agreement. And two, I didn't understand that it was really a semi-permanent easement because we don't know the longevity of the burn itself. So in a way, it's not as definitive an easement as, as many people might feel in their mind. It's not a giveaway of land. It's almost like a temporary lease, if you will, of the property in front of your house for the construction and maintenance of a firm that's going to protect your home. And I think that as we talk to one another and share the information, perhaps a diagram that shows that, a simple one, would be helpful. And I think that communicating this in those terms might be helpful to people who might be overwhelmed by the idea that their property is being given away. Fantastic comments. Can go to this gentleman? Then to Mr. Petty. Uh, we're in Rock City, one in two cents a matter of And I guess to reiterate what a couple of other people said, but if you can help us, we can advocate. All we need to help is insurance and writing that this is irrevocable, meaning that if it's not maintained, the definition of what, may, what not maintained means, the easement goes away. Because although, you know, uh, 
what we're saying. Once it goes away, well, therefore, we're not using it. That's not really clear if the average person agrees with this. Before we go on to Mr. McCready, um, I just wanted to, I said something um, uh, to Jim two or three questions ago. Hey, is, is, is that doable in terms of the, the language around permanent, semi-permanent, what, what have you? Um, you may want to address that if you don't. My answer is I don't know. I'm not the attorney. Uh, we had a question last night. This gentleman over here asked us to make a change. We sent it to the attorney this morning. Fine, we made the change. If it's something we can do, we'll do it. And I have two members of the board here. This is not the town coming down to Hammer Rock and wanting to build a beach and take it. We're coming down here. This project right now is on the top of our list. We have two of them. This one and a beach with nourishment in mind. These are on the top of our list. We're here because we want to get this done to help you protect your homes. If we can do something to make you sleep a little better at night and still get what we need to get, we'll do what we can. If you want me to come down and speak to people, I'm always willing to come down. Food usually gets me to come down faster, uh, as you can probably tell. But, uh, you know, we'll do what we, we can do. As Mara said, a lot of it's going to come down to you because they're your neighbors, you know them. You know, I'm going to come down with my ID and, and talk to them. But they really need to hear you say, hey, this, this is why the town is doing it. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is what it's going to mean. There'll be someone when you come back and the whole front of your house is caved in. That's not going to happen anymore. We're going to, we're going to, that's why we're doing this. So you can be really the influences helping us. As I said, we'll come down, Brad will come down, I'll come down, I'll just talk to them now. We'll, we'll talk to anybody. Give me the language and we'll take a look at it. The best I can promise you. By the way, I appreciate that you come down here with the videos and you really do a fantastic job. Oh, God. Oh, God. Um, first of all, I do appreciate you coming down. You've done a great job of the education of this, from what I can see. But, again, in writing and assurance of it's a vulnerable scenario based on the definition of what it means when the world goes away. So people don't feel that this is my grandkids, my grandkids, grandkids, regardless of what happens. And I think that's what everybody's feeling is like, wow, it's time. It's time to wait for it forever. Take a look at it. Um, um. Or give yourself one of you. Oh, I was going to say, you can text Carol and let her know I'm running late. Stacy, you can text Carol. <laughs> All right, it's quick to his point. If, if he can get the language, in the easement that everybody's done. Apply his house to house number two. There's a lot of people that rent their houses, they're not there, the owner's not there. So but we all know the tax bills go up. So if we could, if, if the town could develop a letter with easement with language that is comfortable, and we can send everybody through the mail, so we know what that is, the tax bills go up. But they're not necessary. At the house. One of the things that came out uh, that we said before is certainly when they get this meeting of that old uh, electronic so people we get the feeling and the erosion can get the answers, but questions answered. At the same time, one of the pieces that uh, they had written up there was some sort of ad hoc, who are the movers and shakers to use uh, more of my which was I go to Florida and in like six weeks on that. Um, so, but if, if a smaller ad hoc group can collectively, to Diane's point, say, all right, how are we going to get this done? Let's roll the sleeves and let's just not ignore it. Let's do something about it. Yeah. Right. So, so that would be part of the discussion with an ad hoc group. That would be like, kind of how to put things in the tax bill. And I can tell you, my tax bill comes to pay by my mortgage money tax bill. I don't want to read it. But we can do a mailing. Try to have it, maybe send it certified, maybe you have to sign for it. We can send mailings with an explanation, with the easement. Yeah, we can do that. Any final questions before we break in? All right. Everybody, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, thank you for